Well, good morning. Happy Friday. Um, no mention from me that the Cubs swept the Cardinals. I wouldn't want to upset any Cardinals fans, including my sister. So I will move right into Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, we've been focusing so far on the incarnation, that being a bigger part of the theme of the verses we've been looking at. Uh, the idea that, that God, the Son, eternally God, sets aside some of the glory, honor, rights, privileges, perks of being God and creator in heaven, and humbles himself, enters time and space through a virgin's womb, becomes one of us. While remaining fully God, he becomes fully man. And yesterday, uh, I ended by suggesting again that uh, the big idea of Hebrews that ought to encourage you is uh, right-sizing Jesus. We mentioned the, the various ways we can get Jesus wrong, starting with not believing that he is who he claims to be. Uh, also looking at the idea that the docetic do view, that he, he only looked like he was a person. And I mentioned a couple other of the Gnostic views and uh, also talked about modalism, the idea that Jesus was, the idea that God was first father and then he became, stopped being father, he became son, and he stopped being son, became spirit. Um, looked at a variety of different historical ways we have we have not understood Jesus, and I said, "Look, um, he's his he is one person with two natures. It's just as much a mystery as the Trinity. God is one God in three persons. Jesus, a hypostatic union, one person with two natures, and we can't grasp this." The, the early church used to say, "Finitum non capex infinitum." Uh, the finite, our finite brains, cannot comprehend, cannot fully grasp the infinite. Well, in my personal devotion today, I was in John 8. Uh, I'm copying the, the Gospel of John, 10 verses at a time. Jesus is a little uh, uh, dust up with the Pharisees because they can't grasp him. He's claiming to, to precede Abraham and to be greater than Abraham. And they're just, they're apoplectic. They can't, they can't comprehend that. And they pick up stones. Once they understand what he's claiming, they pick up stones to put him to death. Um, I also was in Psalm 68. And uh, the devotion book that I use in, Psalm, uh, in the Psalms, uh, the prayer is normally much longer than this. And, but the prayer was simply, uh, fight for me, God. And uh, it was a prayer It struck me. It's a prayer of somebody that's defeated. And I know many of you are feeling beat up. And I'm, I'm trying to give you a big view of Jesus because that changes everything, and give you a prayer. Fight for me, God. Maybe that's all the prayer you can get out today. Know that, that he hears those prayers. So now I want to move on. Hebrews chapter 2, and focus on verses 11 and through 13. So uh, Hebrews 10, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation, again, the forerunner, the captain of their salvation, this is Jesus, perfect through what he suffered. Here we go, moving on. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy uh, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So the focus so far has been on the idea that, that God, the Son, became one of us, became like us in every way except sin. And we could call him he, brother in the sense that he was fully human. Uh, yes, that's a big idea. I want to not miss the other idea, and that is that we can become part of the family of God. Family is an interesting word, as, as you know. As you know, families are not perfect. They're not always even pretty. But a family is a bond that can't be fully broken. You can be estranged from your parents, but your parents are still your parents. You can be sideways with your brothers and sisters, but they're still your brothers and sisters. right? Family bonds are, in that sense, they are eternal. And uh, that's, there's something there to ponder. That's the metaphor that God uses to describe uh, our the unity with him. But, but I want you to also see. Uh, dropping down to verse 13, Jesus, or the writer says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, this is Jesus, and the children God has given me. So it was popular starting in the 60s, culturally in the 70s, theologically, to talk about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And there's truth to that. 
But, there, but the biblical metaphor is not that we're all brothers and sisters, but that we're all neighbors and that we need to love and care for each other and that we need to love our neighbor. Or we need to go especially out of our way if our neighbor is hurting. And that includes people that are foreigners and others, that we are to be gracious in that way. But there is another distinction that is being made here and it comes up out in verse 13. And that is that God does not represent himself as the father of everyone. He, we get adopted into the family of God, and we get adopted by choosing to become part of the family of God. God would not desire that any would perish, but that all would be granted eternal life. But we've got to ask. We've got to say, I want in. We've got to say, I am going to follow Jesus. I am, I am, I am coming in humility, recognizing that I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. And that's how you get adopted into the family of God and become a child. So uh, we have a great, magnificent brother, uh, the Son of God, in a way that we're never sons or daughters of God. Jesus, the firstborn from the dead. And he is not just uh, a brother. He is a Savior. He is God. He is Lord. Focus on him today. Have a good weekend.